Now let's take a look at some properties of C, which you might not be completely familiar with so far if you've only have programmed in Java so far. So the first thing, and this is quite important for especially operating systems, is that you can have pointers to variables. So as we've already seen, each variable has an address in memory, and we can use uh, the ampersand operator to store the address of a variable in another variable which has the type pointer to that variable. So in our code example here, first we have a variable int eastward, which we initialize with a value 4711, as we've already seen. And the second variable int asterisk p means we declare a variable p, which is a pointer to an integer, so it contains the address of an integer variable. And the third line of our code now assigns the address in which our variable eastward is stored, so the memory address at which this variable eastward is located, and copies that address into our pointer variable p. So a variable is a name for a data object, so eastward is a name for the content 4711, whereas p as a pointer is the name for a reference to the object, so essentially it just tells us where this object lives, it just doesn't give, give us the name of uh, or the contents of the object directly. So as we've seen a pointer variable or simply pointer stores the address of another variable, so we also say it points to the variable, and this allows indirect access to the variable. This is very commonly used in C code, so uh, functions can be enabled to modify their parameters. We've seen usually functions only have call by value. If we want to modify parameters passed to a function, we need to pass a pointer to the function. So our code inside of the function can directly manipulate the memory location of that variable. And we can also use it, or we have to use it for dynamic memory allocation and memory uh, management and we can also make programs more efficient by using pointers. But of course pointers come with a number of disadvantages. First, the structure of your program might become less clear, so uh, even if you don't have any global variables or only local variables, it's very difficult to find out which function actually can access which variables because it's not obvious which address of which variable a pointer points to and pointers are the most common source of errors in C programs, and these are sometimes hard to debug when you start programming in C. So the syntax to create a pointer variable is, well, first you give a type like int or char or character, then you have the asterisk character, and then the name of the pointer variable. So we've seen an example on the previous slide here. Here's just another example with an integer variable eastward, which we give the value 4711, a pointer to an integer variable called p, and another integer variable which is uninitialized, which we call x. So in the following line, we just initialize our pointer p, so it points to the memory location, which contains the value we stored in our variable eastward. So p points to eastward now. And the final line of our example code now is something new. When we say x equals asterisk p, we so-called dereference that pointer. So we look up the memory location, then look up what is stored inside of that memory location, and we know it points to eastward. So uh, what's stored in this is the value in our variable eastward, so 4711 and then it copies that value, it reads out of the memory location into whatever is on the left-hand side, so in this case, our variable x. So if we have a pointer to a variable p with asterisk p, we can obtain the contents of the variable stored at that memory location. So to repeat, our address operator, the ampersand character, returns the address of a variable x, and the dereference operator, asterisk, enables access to the content of a variable that is pointed to by the pointer we state. Now we can also pass pointers as function parameters. I already said that parameters are always passed by value in C, so they are copied to the function, so you cannot directly manipulate a value in a function that called your function you're currently executing code in. A function also always 
has a copy of these variables. Uh, so essentially you have to do something else if you want to write a function that actually directly manipulates the parameters that are passed. So when we use a pointer instead of a variable, we can pass the memory address of variables here. And if we have the memory address, we can use these to dereference these pointers. So we can directly read from them, but we can also directly write into these variables here. And this is then a method to implement the so-called call by reference in C. So call by reference means that we actually not have a copy of the variable that's passed, but we have the one and same variable that's passed from our calling function into the calling into the function that's called. So in our code example here, we have a variable int fubi initialized to 42 in our main function, and then we call our increment function, but now we don't pass fubi, so we don't pass an integer, but we pass address of fubi. And we see in the declaration of our increment function on top, it's void ink, so it doesn't return a value directly as an effect of the function. But now it has a parameter which is a pointer to an integer, and this pointer has a name x. And what we do here inside of the ink function is we dereference the pointer to our variable x, and then increment it using the plus plus operator. So what happens here is that when I call the ink function with the address of fubi from main, inside of the ink function, this pointer is copied to our variable x, but it's the same pointer obviously, so it points to the same variable fubi as in main. So this is dereference, so it gives me the name, uh, the contents of our variable fubi, and then we increment it and store it back into that variable here. So this function here can actually increment a value and this incremented value can be seen afterwards after we return from ink in our main function. A use case which is very common is a function which you can use to swap variable values. So if we have a swap function that gets passed two parameters in pointer A and in pointer B, as seen on the right hand side here, we can swap the contents of these variables by dereferencing. So please notice that you cannot directly assign asterisk A equals asterisk B and then asterisk B equals asterisk A because then you would overwrite one value. So you need a temporary value still here to copy the uh, value of one variable before you overwrite it by the contents of the other variable. So in our main function, we have two variables, integer variables, tolerant and international with two values. And when we call swap and we pass the pointers to these two values, uh, variables, then afterwards we see that the result is that the contents of these variables actually are swapped here. So again, using the ampersand operator to take an address, using the asterisk operator to dereference a pointer is important to use pointers in C. You can also define pointers to structures. So it's not only possible to define pointers to scalar values like an integer or character, but it could, that can also work with structures here. And this can, for example, be used to build linked lists. So in our code example here, we have a structure we call list element, and this contains of a character and a pointer to the same structure. So here we can build something that's a more or less recursive definition of a structure. And we have three elements of these structure defined, we call A, B, and C. And now we can chain these elements. So we can set the next element of element A to the address of B, the next element of our instance B of our list element to the address of C, and the next element of our instance C of list element to null. Null is just a shorthand for a value zero usually. So this indicates as a special value that there is no further element. So when we now start reading our list at element A, we can dereference the list element next pointer inside of that structure here. And using that, we can come to B and from B, we can reach C. And in C, when we try to dereference it, we figure out it's null. So if it's null, we shouldn't try to dereference it because otherwise our program will crash. 
So now you can also access structure elements using a pointer. So we already know the asterisk operator can reference a structure and we can use the dot operator to access an element in a structure. So you need to take care that C has roots for so-called operator precedence. So some operators are evaluated earlier than other operators when our compiler parses and compiles our code. So when you use this notation with asterisk and dot to access a structure element where you only have a pointer to that structure, then you need to put brackets around the asterisk pointer name, as in our example here. So we have a struct list element as seen before, and now we have two instances. One is a struct, A, and another one is just a pointer to that struct, P. So in our code, we assign the address of A to our pointer P, and then we want to set the character element Ly of this struct that's pointed to, to a character A in our example here. So what we do is we write dereference P in brackets for uh, ensuring the correct operator precedence. And then from this, we access the element of the structure Ly, and then we can set it to this value. Now, this is very clumsy to write. So the inventors of C have found another more uh, intuitive, I think, notation for this. It works identically. It's sy syntactically nicer and more easily readable, and it looks like an arrow. So yeah, it's somehow a reminiscent of a pointer. So you can just write P dash greater than sign. So P arrow Ly equals A, which means dereference the pointer P, which gives us a structure list element, and then set the element Ly in this structure to the value A. So this is much easier to use, but both notations are actually equivalent. So if you have pointers to scalar data types, you can also have pointers to different objects. So essentially we can also have pointers to pointers or pointers to pointers to pointers and so on. So this is for example used when we want to efficiently encode two-dimensional or multi-dimensional arrays in memory, stuff like that. Uh, there you must take a bit of care to really handle the level of indirection correctly. That's also a big source of errors in C programming. What you can also have is pointers to functions. So a function, as we've seen, is also located in memory. So it has an address in memory. And a pointer to a function is the address of the first instruction of that function in memory, as we've seen before in our nm memory dump. So we can always assign a function to a pointer. So this notation to write pointers to functions is a bit unintuitive, I must say. I must always look it up myself. So if we have a function and we, uh, which gets passed no values, so void, and returns an integer, and we want to declare a pointer to this function, we declare it by the, uh, giving int bracket asterisk func closing bracket and then the parameter list, which is empty here, semicolon. And then we can assign our pointer variable or function pointer func with the address of a function. So we can say func equals address of my function. And then we can call it by dereferencing func. Here we also have to take care of operator precedence. So we have to put the dereferenced func into brackets here. So this can be used to pass a function as a parameter to another function. In operating systems, this is sometimes used by, to define something like callbacks. And one example for this, which is pretty common, is a library function QSort, which implements a quicksort algorithm. And QSort in the standard C library on Unix takes a parameter, which is actually a pointer to a comparison function to compare tuples of elements. So this QSort is not just restricted to, for example, sorting integers, but QSort calls a function, you pass it, to actually compare data elements in the list or whatever array you want to have sorted. So uh, this makes it easier to write a program. Otherwise, you would need a separate QSort function in C for all data types which are supported, which is obviously not a good way to write programs. Now, you're not only restricted to simple data types in C and structures, if you want to make your program a bit more readable, you can also define new names for existing types. This, this works uh, like variable declarations, so you just put a typedef in front. So you can say typedef int length, 
This line is actually just internally used by the compiler. It doesn't use any memory because it only declares a new name for a type. So type def int length means you have a new type, which is called length, and this is just identical to an integer. And now instead of saying int variable name, you can say length variable name, like in our example here, you can say length, and then declare two lengths, type variables len and max length, and you can also pass these, for example, as parameters to functions. So this makes sense because it makes it easier to document what data type is actually expected. So it's not just an integer, but it's an integer, for example, here encoding length. And this is also used commonly in C on Unix. The actual type is hidden. It can be exchanged easily. And there are some well-known examples. So for example, the process ID identifying the unique number your process gets assigned when it's started or created is just an integer, but in Unix it's called a PIT T. So a PIT T indicates that you actually want to work with such a process ID and not just with a generic integer. Another example is file, with the, which is a structure. So this is a type def to a structure defining parameters for a file you want to read or write. And this also helps with documenting code because simple names like length are easier to read and understand like uh, then, for example, complex pointers to a structure, as we will see in the example below. So here we can have type def struct list element pointers le pointer, and then we can just use this le pointer, which is a pointer data type, to declare, for example, pointers or functions which use these pointers as parameters and return values. In addition to structs, scalar data types, uh, and pointers, we also have arrays. Arrays work very similar to Java, but have a number of differences. So early on, C compilers required that the dimensions of your arrays were known at compile time. So the dimensions could only be constants. This has changed in C99. They can also declare uh, variable size arrays. Uh, there are some special regulations. So if you have a global array and it's uninitialized, it's just filled with zeros when you run on the Unix. When you just run bare metal on an embedded system like uh, an AVR processor, this is not always guaranteed. If you have a local array, so an array as a local variable, and this is uninitialized, the contents are actually undefined. And you can also use initializers here, like initialize scalar variables here and this is done using the bracket operator so we can declare a list of primes here so we have a 100 element list of primes each prime is an integer number and the indexes start at zero so the zeroth element of the primes array gets a value of two the first element gets a value of three the second element gets a value of five and so on what's important here is that if you give fewer elements than the number specified in your array declaration, the rest is actually automatically filled with zeros. So primes of 7 to 99 are set to zero automatically when you use this initializer. And you can also do automatic dimensioning so you don't have to count. So if you want to have an array which is initialized with 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, you can say int even and then in square brackets just without giving a number and it automatically dimensions the array to contain six elements here. Now one important difference to Java is that C does not do any bounce checks when accessing arrays. This is done for performance because it's usually faster and the common case is that you don't exceed a bound. But of course when you do it, it's problematic. So you might be able to read array elements that no longer belong to that array because, for example, you try to access the 101st element of primes. Or even worse, you can try to write these elements and so you would overwrite a memory location that just happens to be behind your array in memory and that's usually another variable, so you would corrupt data and these errors are very hard to find. So this is another very common problem of C programming, buffer overflows or array overflows uh, which are the source of many, many C-based security holes. You can also have multidimensional arrays, so you are not restricted to one dimension, but you can have, for example, a matrix giving two dimensions 
multidimensional arrays are very similar here. So you can have a calendar array of integers, which has 12 months and each month has 31 days. So this array has two dimensions with 12 rows and 31 columns. I can have uh, an array giving lecture limits. And here you see how it can have one of the dimensions also be automatically initialized, the first one in this case, and the second one here is given as five. And then you can use a recursively structured uh, bracket notation to actually initialize uh, the values for this array. So here you would have an array with two rows and five columns, just giving, for example, the limits of lecture halls in case we wouldn't have Corona right now. So uh, the default values are defined as for one dimensional arrays and the access to these multidimensional arrays is actually identical to Java. So for example, lecture limits of one, so uh, row one and column three can be decremented by the minus minus operator if somebody takes a chair out of a room. Of course, you can also have arrays of pointers. So this works similar to declare a single pointer just by giving the array dimensions. So you can have a pointer to an integer, an array of pointers to integers called quark with 10 pointers of integers. You can also have arrays of structures. You can have arrays of characters. And that's important and that's a major difference to Java. There is no specific string data type in C. So C is very primitive in this regard. So in C, a string is just an array of characters. So C strings are sequences of single characters and terminated by a zero character. So by a character having the numerical value zero. And you initialize them like normal arrays. So you can initialize uh, the string here, uh, text one, text two, text three, with the same results in three ways. So the first way would be the text one initialization we actually initialize each of the character elements by giving a single character f, u, o, o, and then the uh, final zero to indicate that our string uh, terminates here. For text two, we do the same, but we just replace the character, uh, characters we give directly here by the numerical ASCII values of the characters here, uh, which gives you exactly the same result. And of course, you wouldn't want to use the first or second notation usually, but you would prefer to use the third notation, text three. And this is a shorthand. You can use double quotes around a string. So you can just initialize your character array text three to the string foo with double quotes and your compiler automatically inserts the uh, terminating zero after the final O in your string here. Now, when you write programs, uh, usually programs tend to get a bit more complex and it's not only a good way to write programs to uh, split up your program in different functions, but it also makes it easier to design software when you split up your program into multiple files. So here we have an example of a main.c file which contains our main function. This main function calls hello and just returns zero. But now we see our hello function is not included in main.c, but it's in a different file, hello.c. Hello.c is a separate source code file. This includes the standard IO library because we want to print hello world. And then it has a function void hello, which gets no parameters. And this just prints using printf our string hello world. So we can just try to compile this on the command line. So usually our compiler is yeah, a C compiler, traditionally it was called CC. On Linux, you very often have GCC, the GNU C compiler. You could also have a more modern compiler, which is called Clang. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Both support the C standards we're using in our lectures here. So what you could do is you can say GCC, compile main.c, also compile hello.c, and give it an output file name using dash O of hello underworld world, underline world dot elf. Now this works, you get an executable and when you run it, you actually get a printed hello world on screen. What's important in C, and this is also different to Java and many other systems is that C compiles files completely separately. So we don't have any prototype for the hello function in our main.c file. 
So the compiler all has to assume an implicit declaration of hello when it compiles main.c because it doesn't even know about hello.c because it really just looks separately at all the several source files we compile. So the problem with this is that the compiler does some assumptions whenever you don't give a prototype. So this implicit declaration of hello uh, says it has a return type of int and it doesn't check any parameter types. So this might usually result in a warning of the compiler because the hello function you actually implemented has a return type of void and not of int. And uh, this is of course a conflict. So the compiler notes when it compiles main.c that hello is an undefined symbol, but it notes in the symbol file, oh yeah, there's a symbol hello. We don't know what its value so is so far, so it must be somewhere else. So what's happening here is a bit of magic because GCC not only compiles our source code files, but it automatically com uh, executes the linker afterwards. And the linker looks at the symbol tables of all the compiled files. So from the compiled file for main.c and for the compiled file for hello.c, and then tries to tie up all the missing references. So it sees when it looks at main.c or the compiled file for main.c, that there's an open reference to hello and it finds it in the compiled file for hello.c and then it can patch our binary to actually contain the correct address for the called function when it creates our ELF file. Well, this is obviously a bit questionable. You might want to think about why this is problematic, but of course, uh, giving the hint that there's an implicit declaration and there's no checking of parameter types, you might get an idea of why this is not the really uh, ideal way to do this. So. What else can you do? Well, you could provide a prototype for your hello function in main.c. So uh, you could add the line void hello, opening, closing brackets, semicolon to give the prototype for the hello function. And this also works when giving a compiler option called dash w error, which actually uh, causes the compiler to flag all warnings. It would usually output as errors, so your compilation would fail. Uh, so in this case it works because your compiler is perfectly happy. It has a prototype for hello, so it can actually do a type checking. It knows hello doesn't get any parameter, doesn't return any parameters. This is consistent with our call to hello. This is consistent with which was is in hello.c, so that's fine. But it's still not a good solution because the declaration of hello in hello.c might change. And if you have to change it in hello.c, you have to remember to also change the prototype in main.c, because otherwise your compiler would complain again. So uh, both obviously have to use an identical declaration. Also a thing to think about why they have to do this. So the best way to do is if uh, both actually would use the same declaration here for our prototype for our function hello. And this can be done by using the so-called preprocessor in C. We've already seen the hash includes as part of the preprocessor, but the preprocessor can do quite a number of additional things. So the correct way to do it would actually to generate, uh, be to generate a third file, which we call hello.h. So in hello.h, we just include the prototype for our hello function. So we uh, just give the calling conventions for our hello function. And then we include this header file both in hello.c, so we have a defined prototype for our hello function, and in main.c, uh, so our compiler knows and can type check the call to hello. So include, as we've seen as a preprocessor command, and as we've already seen with standard IO early in this lecture, the preprocessor is pretty stupid. It just copies the contents of the header files to the location of the include in that file. So Internally, while compiling in main.c, this line include hello.h is replaced by the line in hello.h, so by the prototype, and the same happens with hello.c. Now, as you see, there are two different ways to give file names to your include directive. The one we've seen already has used the angled brackets, and these angled brackets means it's somewhere in a search path that's defined by a compiler and your system platform. 
So standardio.h usually comes with your Unix system, so it's somewhere in directory called slash user slash include or somewhere uh, else, maybe on Mac OS X. And these pa uh, passes are searched automatically when you give the angle brackets, whereas when you give double quotes around an include file name, these are relative to the directory of the current C file. So if you store main.c, hello.c and hello.h all in the same directory using the include double quotes hello.h, then uh, the compiler automatically finds hello.h in your current directory, which might your, be your project directory. One thing you should never do is given on that slide. I've seen this many times before in C code for beginners. Uh, they would just in directly include hello.c in main. Well, what happens here is that the text of hello.c is copied at the beginning of main.c, and this is then very problematic. It might lead to an error because it complains about a multiple definition of hello, because if you compile both main.c and hello.c, you have two copies of hello now, one in main.c, one in hello.c. You could actually get it to work by using the include like this, and then only compile main.c, but then again, this would just mean that you include all of your program code in one big source code text file, which is obviously not what you usually want. So please never use this notation by di uh, of directly including C files, always just include header files. So to sum up what happens when we compile a program consisting of multiple files with our example main.c and hello.c again here, including the header file. So the compiler starts, compiles main.c and it generates machine code for this file. And this machine code is also called object code. And that's why it's usually called main.o, the o just indicating its object code. And the symbol table for main.o now contains an indication that we have a function main, which is declared and defined inside of main.o. And we have a reference to a function, which is called hello, which we don't know so far. The next step our compiler takes is it compiles hello.c separately. So again, this gives us a symbol table. This symbol table now tells us, okay, we have a function hello inside of hello.o, which is implemented there. And we have a call to a function printf, which is not implemented in hello.o. So it must be somewhere else. And after our compiler has compiled both main.c and hello.c, we have the main.o and hello.o files. These are then passed to the linker. So the linker starts with main, then sees, okay, in main we have an open reference to something called hello, and then it looks in the other object file in hello.o, is there something called hello implemented? And yes, it is, so it finds it. But then again, it uh, stumbles across a different problem, which is, oh, there's an open reference to printf, so we need to find this somewhere else. Now, we haven't given any other indications of libraries or something like this, uh, but a convention of the C compiler is that it links as the standard library just called libc, so the standard C library, automatically unless you tell it not to do it. So printf is part of our libc library, so what happens when the linker is executed is that main.o and hello.o are linked together with the C library, and this results in our final executable elf file here. So that's really an important difference. The C compiler really compiles everything separately, every single source file. And uh, this has an implication. Uh, so if you only change one source file in a large C project, you only have to recompile this source file into an object file and link it without compiling all the others. So this makes turnaround times for compilation quite a bit faster in this case. So we've seen we don't have many methods to uh, define something like namespaces in C because stuff like that just doesn't exist, but we can still use a simple form of modularity. So if we have global variables, we can still distinguish between variables that can only be accessed from inside the module, so the C file they're declared in, so their declaration is not passed on to the linker, and we can have variables which can also be accessed from other modules. 
If we want to access a global variable of another module, we can use extern. So we have two source files here in our example, compilation unit one and compilation unit two. Both are C source files. Uh, compilation unit one declares and defines an integer variable eastward. And now we want to access this in compilation unit two. And then we say, okay, we want to have something called eastward, which is an integer but we don't want to have a copy of it, but we tell our linker that it's somewhere else, so it's external. So in compilation unit two, by giving the extern keyword, we tell the compiler, please don't make a new variable called eastwood, that would be a conflict, but just look for another variable in another object file that's called eastwood, and then use the same address, so the same variable for both. Now, if you have certain global variables that you don't want other C files to uh, access, so to read or write, you can use a so-called type qualifier, and this type qualifier is called static. Static makes global variables invisible to other modules, so if you have a compilation unit 1.c, and now you declare your integer variable as static in eastward, and you have your compilation unit 2.c, which still has extern in eastward, the linker would actually complain that it can't find eastward when it tries to link compilation unit 2 because this name of the symbol was not ex exported from compilation unit one because we gave it the static qualifier. This enables a very primitive encapsulation of data inside a module, so not as elegant as an object-oriented systems. This is one way to prevent name collisions at link time, and this is also considered good programming style, even if it's a bit more work to do. Now to access functions in other modules, extern is not required as we've already seen. Uh, so this is a bit of a idiosyncrasy in C that uh, the linker actually automatically takes care of functions but not of variables. Uh, functions like variables can also be declared static and this is used for functions that should also only be visible inside of your module, so inside of the current C source file. So these functions can only be called by functions which are inside of the same C file as the function declared as static. So they're not part of the module interface, and again, they're not exported, so the linker can't see them. We can also declare local variables as static, and that's a bit strange because they're not visible outside of the local function themselves. So what happened here is that the C compiler writers actually got lazy and reused this static keyword. This is not a good idea, but it's the standard. So declaring a local variable as static has a completely different meaning than declaring global variables or functions as static. So when you declare a local variable as static, you actually mean that, and you tell the compiler that it has to take care of, that the variable value actually survives between subsequent function calls. So we have a function unsigned odd number, and this has a static variable, uh, which is an unsigned integer variable called n, and we initialize this to one, only the first time odd number is called, and then we return n plus equals two, which not only returns the number n incremented by two, but also sets the value of n to the previous value plus two. And because it's static, when we call odd number the next time, it retains this value. So for the first call of odd number, it's initialized to one. The second call of odd number retains that value of n and has a value of three. The third call has five and so on. So essentially, this turns your variable n into something like a global variable, but this is still only accessible inside of the function it was declared in, so inside of your odd number function here. As I said, this is definitely confusing at first because this has a completely different meaning compared to the other uses of static. Uh, that's a bit, yeah, a cause of the historic events of C development over the last, like, almost 50 years. So we've already used the preprocessor to uh, use includes for system header files and for our own header files giving prototypes of functions. But the preprocessor can do a bit more, so it can do mostly text replacements. So we can define and use so-called preprocessor symbols. Using the hash define command, you can define a name like horse here and give it another string. So we can define something that's called horse and we just give it the value 4711. This is just four characters, so the compiler doesn't imply that it's a number or something else. Now, whenever 
this string horse shows up subsequent to the definition of this preprocessor symbol horse, there's a text replacement. So what your preprocessor in your C compiler does is it just replaces the text horse, H-O-R-S-E, these characters, which whatever was defined. So in this case, 4711. So this is a text replacement that actually takes place before uh, your compiler starts uh, parsing and scanning your code. So essentially, it's a separate part of the compiler, which was invented to make it a bit easier to, for example, give uh, speaking names to constants and so on. You can also use defines to do conditional compilation, and this is very often seen in C code. So again, we define a simple horse, giving it a value of 4711. And only if it's defined, we print horse. Otherwise, we would print no horse. So again, this is a text replacement here. So uh, the preprocessor actually checks if the symbol was defined. If it was defined, it copies the first printf line into your source code file, which is to be compiled. And if we didn't include the define horse line in the first line, it would actually use the second printf line to copy into the source file instead of the first one. So in this case, this example is just transformed by the preprocessor to printf horse. And that's what our actual compiler sees afterwards. The preprocessor is actually smart enough not to modify strings, but unfortunately it's not very much smarter. So if we define horse to be 17 plus four, as I've said, this is just a string of four characters, one, seven, the plus sign and the four. Uh, it just does a stupid text replacement. So if we use this defined uh, preprocessor symbol, uh, in an arithmetic expression like seen on the lower left hand side here, if three times horse equals 63, well, we would usually assume, okay, 17 plus four is 21, three times 21 is 63, so yeah, that works. But take a look what this is actually transformed into on the right hand side. So this is actually transformed to, into the string if three times 17 plus four without any brackets or something. And this means it first calculates three times 17, which is 51. And then it adds four, which is 55. So this is obviously not equal to 63. So what happens here is that your code does something unexpected. So you really have to be careful when using preprocessor symbols in arithmetic expressions. But this is nevertheless often done. And when you want to do it, you need to be a bit more careful. Uh, by putting, for example, brackets around it. But still putting brackets is not that simple. Macros can be a bit more extensive, so you can also define something which is called square of x, and your preprocessor is intelligent enough to know that whatever is inside of the brackets uh, is something that should be replaced. So uh, we define square of x as x times x. So whenever we use it, like on the top left hand side, in a printf uh, command, for example, here, if we use square of three, this is textually replaced, just the square is replaced by three times three. Uh, you must take care when you use this not to use spaces between the name of the macro and the opening bracket, and there is no semicolon at the end of the line for preprocessor symbols. Now this looks better because we have brackets, so we could maybe use this in arith arithmetic expressions, but we still need to be careful because, yeah, it looks like a function that only gets one parameter, but essentially for our square function, we have twice x on the right hand side, and it's just a text replacement. So what happens uh, if we uh, call square of one plus two? Well, we only have a text replacement here and we have an arithmetic expression, so we have to be careful again. So this is again transformed in one plus two times one plus two. Operator precedence is applied, so it's one plus two plus two. So this is actually five and not, as you expected, nine. So the solution to all these problems is to use brackets around each and every use of the parameter, as well as the overall expression. And only then you're at least safe for using it in these contexts here because your arithmetic expressions are then in a correct uh, operator hierarchy. Now, uh, 
Usually macros are constrained to just span a single line, so the preprocessor is really simple. If you want to use a separate lines, so several lines to define your macros to make it easier readable, or to use really long macros, you can use a backslash character at the end of each line. Uh, so this would mean just uh, uh, to the preprocessor that it accepts all these separate lines joined by the backslash characters as one long line. But still with parameterized macros, you can have stupid side effects. So really, really be careful when you use these. So again, we define our square of x macro to be x times x, this time with correct brackets. Now uh, we call it with an argument of plus plus x. So this is transformed to plus plus x times plus plus x. So we have a pre-increment operator, which means that x is actually incremented twice in this uh, expression here and this well is a good question what the output is I encourage you to try it and it's not really obvious I suppose and this is even worse when you use function calls with side effects so uh, whenever you have uh, whatever uh, function call result which you would want to pass to square like in the example in the middle of the screen you would call square of the result of a function launch missile well, uh, actually, this is uh, replaced by launch missile function call times launch missile function call. So you multiply the results of two calls to launch missile and, uh, well, instead of launching one missile, you launch two automatically. This is probably not what you wanted. In addition to having conditional compilations, you can also check the value of defined macros in a preprocessor using the hash if preprocessor command. So you can define a preprocessor macro horse to have the value for 711. And then you can check for this value during compilation. So if the value of horse equals to 815, then we print horse and otherwise we print no horse. Again, this is a text replacement. So it either copies the first or the second print at line to our resulting file, which is then finally compiled. So in this case, this would be transformed into no horse because 4711 the uh, string r symbol horse was defined to is obviously not identical to 815. Now when we consider include files we can also have additional problems. So let's look at a scenario where we have multiple header files and mutual includes. So in our example here we have a header file scheduler.h which includes foo.h and club.h but clock.h also includes foo.h. In turn, scheduler.h is included by bar.h, which is in turn included by quark.h. Quark.h includes serial.h, and quark.h in turn is included by clint.h. And the inclusion on the right-hand side here is very interesting. So you can actually have something like recursive inclusions. So lie.h would include clint.h and clint.h would include lie.h. Well, this would in general result in an endless recursion and your compiler won't be very happy because it might run out of memory if it doesn't figure it out. So essentially you have to cope with two problems here. The first one is that contents of header files, remember this is just a texture replacement that these contents of header files are repeated. So when you include clock.h and foo.h on the left hand side and scheduler.h, you end up with two copies of foo.h, which of course the compiler complains about because it sees double definitions of everything in foo.h. And in two, you, as we've seen, you have this endless recursion which your compiler doesn't like. And the common solution uh, to avoid these problems is to use include guards. So include guards are used to guarantee that each header file is only included once when you use an include statement. So in this header file on the right lower side here, uh, you see what we do is a little trick. So inside of each header file, which is called whatever.h, we define a preprocessor macro called underline underline whatever underline h and then two closing underlines. Then we have the usual header file contents and around all the file we put this guard and this guard is an if and def. So only if this symbol has never been defined before, include the rest of the file. If this has been defined before, because we have included this header file already, just 
don't include the rest of the file. So this include guard actually enables you to ensure, even if you have strange situations like these, that each include files only ends up once when you include in these complex circumstances. What else do we have in C? Something that's not very common in other programming languages is so-called union. So we've already seen structs or structures. Structs group multiple elements in memory one after the other. So whatever, you have an integer and a character and another integer one after the other in memory, and these are separate data elements. Whereas a union groups multiple elements in memory on top of each other. So essentially using a union, you can create an alias to a variable that gives it, for example, another data type. This can be used, for example, uh, to access a memory location as an integer and also as four separate characters on a 32-bit machine. So the same memory area could be accessed as integer as well as a four-character character array. And this is shown on the right-hand side here. Now we have a union don't know. And this union has two elements, and these elements are at the same memory location. So the array with four elements of characters ly occupies the same memory location as our int variable eastward. So whenever we write something to eastward, we also overwrite the value of our array ly. And the other way around, whenever we change something in our array ly, we also change the value of eastward. And this can be used to convert types. So when we declare a union, don't know, uh, well, so a variable of that type, which we call just whatever, and initialize this, we can only initialize the first element. That's a restriction of C. So we could only initialize our character array, for example, to foo and the automatic closing zero byte, which is automatically inserted because you initialized it with a constant string. So in main, we can first start to print this variable here. And we print this variable here, whatever, dot eastward. Now, what you see here is we initialize the ly array, but we read the eastward array and we get a value out of it, which is 6f, 6f66, as shown on the left-hand side. And then we can initialize whatever, dot eastward to this strange decimal number, 7496034. And then we can print the array as a string, as a character array, and we get something back that's called bar. So the first printf produces this hex string 6f6f66, and the second printf produces the string bar. So this is a good idea to think about what happens here, because if you know and understand what happens here, you've understood pointers uh, in the general case and also the storage of variables to memory. Now, arrays in memory are stored in memory one after the other. So whenever we have an array of several elements, it just starts at an address and then it uses subsequent addresses to, to, to store the next array elements. So in our example code here, we have an integer variable foo, which is a short integer, so it means it's a 16-bit variable, so it uses two bytes only, which we initialize to 24. We have a character array called word, which is initialized with a string quark and the ending zero again. And we have another integer variable called cuckoo, which is initialized to a hexadecimal value a, b, c, d. And usually all these, when you declare them like these, one after the other, are put into memory one after the other also. So the first value in memory is uh, 24 or hexadecimal 0x80. And then uh, you have a filler which is a zero, and this zero indicates that strings usually start an, on an address divisible by four. We've only used two bytes for the first variable, so we fill this up with two other bytes containing zero. Then we have our bytes containing the string quark, and then we might have uh, the bytes of our integer variable cuckoo at the end. And these elements of arrays can also be complex data structures again, so we can have a three element array uh, like shown in the lower case and we have these you see all the uh, rows of the array are put next to each other and then uh, uh, the next one starts and so on and so forth so these are also one after the other in memory and you can see it here 
as an example, we just did a memory dump of our data section and you can try to figure out where this example comes from and I think we'll have an exercise on this. So when you use arrays in C, you've already seen that arrays come with a number of problems and the biggest problem actually is that there's no bounds check. And the reason why there is no bounds check is that actually there are no arrays in C. It's just an illusion. So arrays are actually implemented as pointers to a base data type, which the array is made up of. So array identifiers can be seen as just a constant pointer to the start of an array. So you can say character array text equals quark. So this is initialized. And then you can have a pointer to a character which is initialized with text. Text is just a shorthand. It's just the name of the array. It's synonymous to the address of the first array element of text. So having the index zero, it's synonymous to address of the element zero of our, arrays, uh, of our array text. And then you can initialize uh, some element of uh, this uh, character a pointer points to. Yes, so you can say dereference our pointer C, and we know it points to the first character, so to a Q in our text array, and you can replace this character by a K, and so this Q in our text array would then, because you access it using this pointer, be replaced by a K. Pointers can also be used like error identifiers, so if you have declared your character pointer before, you can also use C of 1 as uh, if it would be an array, and you can write a W to it. So this would change the text to quark with a w. Uh, it doesn't always work the other way around because error identifiers are not variables, but they're constants. So error identifiers have no address in memory. That's a difference to pointers. So uh, essentially uh, you could usually not do address of text. Uh, it returns the same address as text so this is just a convention actually to make life easier for you uh, to program your pointers using arrays. Now, what you can also do is if you have a pointer, you can add or subtract values to or from it. So we can do computations using pointers and array identifiers. So uh, again, we have a character array text initialized to quark and we have a character pointer C which is now initialized not to text, but to text plus one. So it doesn't point to the zeros element, the Q, but it points to the next element, which is a U in our string. And if we then override this character at this position in memory, our C points to with a W, we end up with quark with a W. And we can also override the contents of address text plus four with a B, which gives us quark afterwards. And we could also overrides C minus one, so we can get negative offsets. So C still points to the former U, which we overwrote to we, uh, with a W. So C minus one points to the Q, and we can override this with a Z, so this would end up in Zwarp. So we have several shorthands for writing uh, accesses to array elements. Text of four is just another expression for dereferencing the pointer to the start of our text array plus Four. Text plus one can be written as the address of the element one in our array text. And you can also do C of minus one instead of uh, just dereferencing a pointer C and subtracting one from it before you dereference it. And you see this in very many C code sequences, especially in operating systems. So whenever you encounter it, it's good to know what's going on there. So here we have an example of the code that just outputs quark three times using the three different methods you've seen before. So the first method is, uh, the first for loop uh, is just accessing each character of our text array separately as a character. The second one is using it accessing pointer syntax. And the third one is actually using it by uh, calculating each pointer explicitly and dereferencing it separately. So the roots on the lower right hand side is if you have a pointer P and a scalar value S, then P plus S is identical to the address of the S element of our array P. Dereferencing P plus S is identical to accessing the S element of P. 
and p plus plus and this is important is equal to p is the address of the next element in our array now if we have arrays different from a base type char which uses a single byte then we have to be very careful with pointer arithmetics so we've seen p plus x equals the address of the s's element of p in the general case when we do p plus plus p is not incremented by one so if we have an array of integers which p points to and we do p plus plus the address is incremented by the size of the basic array element so the size of an integer so the size of four so you have to be really careful when doing pointer arithmetic because the address difference when you add something to a pointer indicates that the difference is always the number of array elements so when you do plus four in an integer array or in a pointer to an integer uh, you actually increase your pointer by a value of 16 four times four this is really important to know because this is also the source of very many errors when you do C programming. Again, you can have uh, pointer arithmetics also with multidimensional arrays. And here on the right hand side, you see six different ways to write the same operation, just setting an element to the value of five. So again, this can be very confusing, especially if, as here, pointers to pointers are actually used. Uh, so, uh, especially if you're new to programming C, I encourage you to avoid using pointers wherever you can, but of course sometimes it's unavoidable, and especially if you reuse code or you use library functions using pointers, you have to know how to operate on them. We've seen strings already, and we know that strings are also just an illusion in C, because strings are just arrays of characters. And we've seen that we can initialize strings using the double quote init, uh, init method, so uh, which automatically uh, appends a zero byte to the end of our string in memory. And uh, what we do here is, uh, well, on the left-hand side, we initialize a character array foo to the string quark. And then the main function now, we set the zeros element to k. And it works. So this outputs quark with a k at the beginning. Now on the right hand side this almost looks identical. So we de uh, declare a pointer to a character and we initialize this pointer with the address of the string quark. And then we try to set the zeros element to k and when we execute this we get an output which is segmentation fault. So this is the message of the operating system telling you that you've tried to do something, usually an access to memory, which was not allowed, because you might have tried to access a non-existing memory location, or you might have tried to write to a memory location, which is only readable. So uh, this is really important. So the right-hand side, when you declare it like this, a character pointer to a constant string, this constant string is in a read-only data segment. So read-only, as the name says, means that your C compiler actually prohibits you to write or change this string. So modern C compilers actually have problems with this code and they compile it, but when you try to execute it, you get a segmentation call for it. Now, if you have ancient C code, sometimes this relies on strings like these on the top right-hand side to be writable. So there is an option for a compiler slash f writable strings that changes this behavior, but I would not recommend you to use it. All right. Now, if we want to use uh, strings, of course, we need to not only have methods to output strings, but we also need to have methods to input strings. And here we also have to take care. So this is the source of very many security problems and uh, very dangerous to use, so you should avoid it. So what we do here in the first example is we declare a character array with 64 character elements and then we use a C function scanf, so scan formatted. And here, like with printf, the format string indicates now the uh, type of input you expect, so percent %s is a string. So scanf uh, is told that it has to expect a string 
and it stores the string that you input on the keyboard into memory at the location you pass it as the next parameter. So this is the address of our element foo. So what happens here is, well, it works in most of the cases. As long as you only enter strings that are uh, shorter than 64 ca uh, characters, your code works. But what happens when you enter a string that's longer than 64 characters? Now, then the compiler doesn't really know about the size of it because you only pass a pointer to foo. So it doesn't know it's only 64 elements. So it just happily writes to memory whatever is behind our character array foo in memory. So it overrides different data. And this can be used to exploit security holes. We'll take a closer look at what happens in these cases at the end of the operating systems course, especially. So uh, you can do better by giving an explicit qualifier percent 63s, uh, which tells uh, your code at runtime that it must stop after reading 63 characters. Why isn't this 64? Because to indicate the end of the string, a zero byte is always appended, also by scanf, so we can only read 63 characters because we need one character space to store the final zero. And we also have dangerous library functions like string copy, which gets two pointers to strings. And if the pointer which we copy to points to an array which is shorter maybe than the string on the right hand side that we copy from, well, it also overrides memory. The same can happen with string compare, which compares two strings or string cat, which just copies one string to the end of another string. Because all these functions operate just character by character until the final zero byte is read. And yeah, since the compiler doesn't really know about the size of these data types, because as we've seen, these arrays are just an illusion and just implemented internally using pointers, these are all potentially dangerous and you should not use them. There are better alternatives available, strn copy, strn compare, and strn cat. And the n in these function names indicates that you have to give a limit. So this additional parameter limits processing to n characters. You still have to know how big your array is. So if you make a mistake there and give an n that is too large, you can still get a buffer overflow. But this is better than nothing. So this was a quick overview of C programming, the C crash course. And if you want to know more about this, if you want to dig a bit deeper, uh, here are some references to literature. So the first one is the really still classic book on C programming written by uh, two of the researchers at Bell Labs who invented the C language, uh, Brian Kernigan and Dennis Ritchie. This is called the C programming language. Make care to get the second edition from the library. There's the first edition, which is really ancient. Uh, this is still the standard book on C programming, but it doesn't include more recent developments in C, like the C99 standard, because this book already was published in 1988. Uh, digging deeper, there's a nice book by Peter van der Linden, Expert C Programming, Deep C Secrets. This is more of a second book when you're already a bit familiar with C, uh, so it has a bit more of a conversational style. The uh, first book is a bit more dry and formal, but it's very short. And the uh, expert C programming book has lots of real world examples and tricks. So it's very interesting when you know a bit about C. Uh, when you uh, want to know a bit more about what happens below, so this might be interesting also for compilers. Uh, there's a book by Igor Sirkov, low level programming C assembly and program execution on Intel 64 architecture. This concentrates on what actually happens when your compiler compiles code. So the relation of computer architecture, assembly, and C code. And it covers some interesting topics on compiling C code. And when you want to know more details about programming in Unix, there's a standard book, which I really can recommend by Richard Stevens and Stephen Rago, Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment. There's also a second edition, which is the standard book on programming in C on Unix-like systems, and especially for operating systems. If you want to dig deeper, I can uh, really recommend it. Of course, all the information you need for working on the exercises is provided in the lecture slides and in other references to literature. So that's our C crash course. That's our first uh, week of lectures for this semester. Thanks for listening. And in the next week, we'll then start off with our lectures in compilers and operating systems separately. Thanks for listening and have a good day. Bye.